friends, God's knowledge is very different than what we might at first think uh, before we have really studied it out to see what the Bible says. So remember, we're in this series of the eternal gospel from Revelation 14, 6 and 7, where the eternal gospel has those three main points. Fear God, give God glory, worship the Creator, and that, that's our three points. Now, for several lessons now, we've been looking at the fact that the fear of God that the Bible is speaking about here, this right relationship kind of fear of God, is an active, growing fear. It's active and growing. It produces fruit. And if it is not active and growing, and if it is not producing fruit, then it is not the fear of God that the Bible speaks about. So, we're going to go back to the Gospel of John, chapter 15. This is the parable of that Jesus told us. He starts out in verse 1. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. And then jump down to verse 7. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Now, we see here, and we know, that the vine grows down, down in the dirt, it has its roots, and the vine grows up, and they train it to be in a certain form. And the vine, if you've ever been to a vineyard where they have a lot of older grapevine, uh, grapevines, the vine itself may look dead. It, I mean, it looks really pretty bad. And then in the spring, The vine starts sending out some shoots, and the shoots have leaves, and then the, the fruit appears. And if they have pruned it right, if they've done everything right, it's a very bountiful harvest. Now, in our, in our English Bible that we read tonight, it says, my father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. In Greek, it's very similar, but it has a, a different stress. In Greek, it would be something more like any time when fruit occurs, my father is glorified. So that the, the the idea is not that we're, we're going to bear fruit every day. There's going to be a growing season. There's going to be a fruit-bearing season. There's a harvest season. And these seasons keep, keep going with the, the cycle of the growth, the, the fruit, the harvest, so that when we bear the fruit, that God is glorified. And as the process is going along, God is glorified too. But the spiritual fruit that's going to be produced comes because the branch 
is in right relationship to the vine. The branch has no contact with the soil or the roots or any of that life-giving nutrients except where it is in connection with the branch. The right relationship produces fruit. In our parable tonight, today, And the same is true. Yeah, this fear of the Lord that accompanies salvation, right? That's the, the word that describes the right relationship that Adam and Eve had with God before they sinned. It's the word that describes what God does for us when we are born into his kingdom. Yeah, right relationship always produces fruit. Now, just so we don't get messed up here a little bit, some people mistakenly believe that the fruit of other of Christians is other Christians. It's a fairly popular thing to preach nowadays. Uh, unfortunately, it's not true. The f no branch produces more branches. No branch prunes the other branches the vine dresser that's god he is the one who grafts on new branches he's the one who cuts off the unfruitful branches he is the one who prunes the other branches so right relationship produces fruit the fruit glorifies god so if we were to ask, what are the fruits of the Spirit? Those of us who have remember our Sunday school days, the fruit of the Spirit is agape love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. These are the fruits of the Holy Spirit. They come when we are in right relationship. The fruit comes. So that if we have a person who we don't see fruit in, we have to wonder, are they truly in the vine or not? <clears throat> With that picture in mind, the first part of the eternal gospel is fear God. Give God glory. What does God say? What does Jesus say? Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So we cannot miss this relationship. Right relationship, fruit. Right relationship, fruit. There is a, a pattern that we don't want to get away from. Now I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Look in Psalm 111, verse 10. Now, we're going to go deeper in this than we've ever gone before. I'm hoping to be able to help you to see how these things work together. So in Psalm 111.10, the first part of the verse says, the fear of the Lord and it says, is the beginning uh -oh. the beginning of Wisdom. Okay. 
Hey, Charlie. Hey. Good to see you, sir. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Right relationship produces fruit. Wisdom is not the end of wisdom, it's the beginning of wisdom. Then in verse, in the second part of verse 10, it says, Say Cal. Remember, this is a word that we know, Hebrew word, Seikau, translated good understanding. Some verses, some places call it sagacity. Have all those who do his commandments, his praise endures forever. So, we know that Seikau happens when wisdom grows and matures and the person has learned how in a practical way to use the wisdom in their daily life. Wisdom grows out of, so if we, if we use our pattern, we could say biblical wisdom grows out of right relationship with God as wisdom grows in us it produces say cow then see cow that's when it becomes mature okay that is there's a pattern right relationship produces fruit okay question because we're going to stay on this all night I'm going to give you lots of different examples. Proverbs 15, 33. Okay. Proverbs 15, 33. The fear of the Lord is a is the instruction for wisdom and honor comes before humility now the fear of the lord is the instruction The instruction before honor comes humility. Before honor comes humility. No, I mean, where you, what you said it's like honor comes first. Then I'm before. sorry. I just my glasses off. Okay. <laughs> Is the instruction for wisdom okay. right? Relationship produces the fruit. Now, this word instruction is important. It's not, the word instruction as God uses it here is different than what we might think of with instruction. The word instruction in Hebrew means, and it's got a fairly broad meaning, chastisement, reproof, warning, Doctrine, discipline, instruction. Okay? Chastisement, reproof, warning, doctrine, instruction. And also the word in there, discipline. Okay? The fear of the Lord is the discipline.
that produce that leads to wisdom. What does this mean? How could we understand it? The fear of the Lord, when constantly exercised, And constantly exercise produces wisdom. There's another word that we might not think about in this context. We could say the fear of the Lord when tried produces wisdom. What does tried mean in this sense? The fear of the Lord, when applied in a practical sense, produces wisdom. We understand SACAL and CCAL, that's talking about a person who has learned to use the wisdom and understanding of God in his or her everyday life, practical life to make right decisions, right? That's just, that's what it means. And here he's telling us the fear of the Lord is the instruction when constantly exercised, when constantly tried, applied in a practical sense, produces wisdom. What does he say in, in the New Testament? Let me see if I can turn to it real fast. Hebrews 5.14 Solid food is for the mature, who because of practice, some versions say, who because of constant use, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Who because of constant use, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Yep. Some people want to think about the fear of the Lord as being a, a interesting intellectual idea. But the Bible teaches the fear of the Lord that we use it in a practical sense in our life every day. That's what produces Seikau and Seikau. We have to use it because of constant use have their senses trained to discern good and evil. All right, Proverbs 15, 24. Oh, I sure hope I wrote that down right. Yes. Proverbs 15, 24. Tried means applied in a practical way. Okay. 1524, the path of life leads upward for the wise. The word there is actually sagacity. That he may keep away from Sheol or the grave beneath. The path of life leads upward for the one who has sagacity because in Every time he comes to a place where he has to make a decision, he's going to test, apply the, the word of God to that situation and see, that's where the test comes, the tribe comes, see if by applying the word of God to a practical situation in his daily life to see if God produces the fruit that he promised he would. Okay. 
So Proverbs 1, 7. Proverbs 1, 7. You know these verses. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now that word there that's translated instruction is the same word from Proverbs 15, 33 we just looked at. The fear of the Lord is the instruction for wisdom. Fools. Who are the fools? What are the synonyms? Fools. Silly. Seducible. Sinners is also another word for those who've never been converted yet. Now we're fixing to look at in Genesis Adam and Eve coming in contact with Satan. Are they going to be seducible? Yeah. They haven't yet learned. They haven't yet tried. They haven't yet learned to constantly exercise the fear of the Lord in their decisions. Okay? The fear of the Lord is discipline to knowledge. It is const when constantly exercised, when constantly tried and proved, constantly, it is the right school. It produces knowledge in us, including knowledge of good and evil. Now, this is where it's going to get tricky. Sometimes, when we do this tried and tested, we don't see the the results for a long time. Sometimes we see bad results really quickly and we don't see the good results but for a long time. But that does not mean that God's word is not right. Try. That's our word. We're going to try. Try in the sense of, in a practical sense, apply it. Tried means applied in a practical sense in everyday life. All right. Now, then let's go to... We understand just as in wisdom, there's two kinds of wisdom. There's two kinds of knowledge. This is the knowledge that, that God, from God's perspective is how I'm going to call it. From God's perspective, and there is knowledge from Satan's perspective. We have to learn to distinguish between the two. And to understand this, we have to go back to how we started tonight. We must understand the relationship between vine, branch, fruit. Fear God, always give God glory, produces much fruit. And the fear of God as the discipline to wisdom, when it is constantly exercised, 
constantly tried and constantly proved to be true. Okay? When I was 17, God called me to be a pastor. When I surrendered to be a pastor, a preacher, I thought my life was over. I mean, I'm going to do it, but my life is over. All the good stuff is gone. Okay? But by obedience, I tried it. I applied it in a practical sense in my everyday life. Now, 68, I look back and I say, that was probably the, one of the smartest things I ever did was to be obedient because I can't imagine how my life would have turned out had I not applied in a practical sense. And very often, what we are applying is obedience. Even if we don't understand, we obey. So let's go back to Genesis 2, 9. Some of this will be new for you. Some of this will be a review of things we've talked about many times. But hopefully you're going to be able to see this in, in the, this new perspective. So in Genesis 2, 9, Adam and Eve are living in Eden. We've already talked about the fact a long time ago that the word means, Eden means rich place or delightful place, super abundance. And so in that good place, that rich place, God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. Every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. And in the past, we've talked about how, based on the size, and the, my friend, who that was his business, he, he had a gift to be able to determine these kind of things, probably millions of trees growing in what we would call the Garden of Eden. So think about millions of trees on which are growing everything that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. Then there is a tree of life, just one, and there is one tree, the knowledge of good and evil. So, Eden was a spiritual kindergarten for Adam and Eve. Now, we have to go back and understand what God is asking Adam and Eve to do. When we go back to chapter 1, verse 28, God has asked, not asked, he has commanded that Adam and Eve be fruitful and multiply. Notice he doesn't say be fruitful and multiply and fill the garden. He says be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. There has to be a lot of food for physical growth. But there's more than that. Not, all, not only are they to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, they are subdue the earth. To subdue the earth and to fill the earth, they have to learn transportation, they have to learn communication because how can the people in the garden communicate with the people who are at the furthest ends of the earth? Transportation, communication. They have to learn uh, all the sciences, medicine. How are you going to have all these babies being born if you don't have doctors and nurses? How are you going to raise these children? There's a lot that they have to learn physically. Then they have to rule over the birds of the sky and over every over the fish of the sea and over every living thing, everything they need for, for physical growth is in the first huge number of trees, everything that is good 
for food pleasing to the sight. But they have to spiritually be prepared also. Think about 1 Corinthians 6, 3. God didn't just suddenly invent 1 Corinthians 6, 3. It's always been there. This is part of why God created people. 1 Corinthians 6, 3. Do you not know that we will judge angels? People who are created now a little lower than the angels, that in heaven we will judge angels. We will we have authority and a little power. Angels have a little knowledge of authority and great power. We've learned that knowledge always controls power. I mean, authority always controls power. So in the garden, not only did God provide everything they need to grow physically, but everything to grow spiritually. The, spirit, the thousands or millions of trees is for physical. The tree of life, the tree of knowledge and good and evil is to train them spiritually so that they will be able to, when the time comes, to judge angels. Remember, the fear of the Lord, the right relationship, is our instruction for wisdom when constantly exercised, constantly tried and proved. We grow. That's how we develop SACAL, CCAL, sagacity. We've talked about that. And they have to learn discernment. Discernment. 2 Corinthians 2, 45, 15, and 16. We have to think about these things in the context of the Garden of Eden. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 15 and 16. We, that's those who are children of God. Let's back up even verse 14. That's fine. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are being, who are perishing. To the one, an aroma from death to death. To the other, an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? The aroma. Is aroma important to God? Well, what is the seventh gift of the Holy Spirit in Isaiah 11, 1 through 3. Quick understanding or delighting. Why? Because they make the sacrifice. God smells the aroma when it's done right, and God is pleased. Aroma. Think about the aroma of life, the aroma of death. We do this all the time in our in our in our normal physical life. We take something out of the refrigerator. We open up the package of meat. It has a bad smell. Right? If it's fresh, it has one smell. If it's spoiled, it has another. To discern by smelling. So let's think about the aroma of the tree of life. And the aroma of the knowledge of good and evil tree. What is the knowledge of the good of evil tree going to produce? Is it not death? This is going to produce life. Does it if if physical food has an aroma, 
What kind of aroma do you think these millions of trees had for physical food? Would it not be a delightful, appealing smell? A bacon tree would smell really nice. A bacon tree would smell really nice. You said that would be pleasing to the eye and taste. Okay. A bacon tree would be pleasing to the taste. Okay. Now, let's imagine every day on our wet walk out into the garden to collect the food we're going to eat that day. We brought, we walked by a, a tree that smells like. Ooh, that thing smelled like death. Been dead for 20 days out in the hot sun. But it didn't. Hang on. You, you got to listen just a little bit more. Okay. Sorry. And then we walk by another tree that smells like life. Would that teach us discernment? What if we did it every day? We practiced that every day. Death, life. I'm going to go out and eat all these things that are beautiful, taste good, look good, smell good. It would teach us discernment. <clears throat> then what if somebody comes along and says, you know what? You guys, you're missing the best stuff. You see this stuff that smells really, really bad? If you do X, Y, and Z to it and put it in this special air fryer or a meat smoker or whatever, it's going to be great when it comes out. But it still smells bad because it still produces death. You see what I'm saying? Discern. Now then, God created us to be a mirror of God's glory. We fear God in right relationship. We give God glory. God wants to grow and train us through the exercise of obedience to God's word. This constant use of God's word was to prepare us for eternal life and all that God has for us there. The fear of the Lord that is constantly exercised, tried and proven in our everyday life prepares us. Constant use, constant practice spirit produces spiritual growth, giving glory to God. Now then, Proverbs 8, 13. We're not going to be talking about the way it smells anymore. Although the smelling is, as he says in the New Testament, there's an aroma to life, an aroma to death. Proverbs 8, 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. So every morning, if I'm living in the garden, I'm going to go out to pick from the millions of good trees, and I walk by this tree of the knowledge of good and evil that God has told to me, if you eat it, you die being separated from the holiness of God, from the relationship with God, is evil. A knowledge of good and evil. But I practice constantly, every day, applying the fear of the Lord in a practical sense every day of my life. How does it look like? I hate this tree. I hate it. I hate it. When I walk by this tree, I say, ooh, this tree produces life. I love that tree. I love the millions of trees that God has given me. When we obey by, by applying in a practical sense 
every day God produces fruit. The fear of the Lord produces fruit. The fear of the Lord in this sense is to hate this, and the fruit is I avoid it. You understand? Now then, from God's perspective, From God's perspective. Is this a good tree? The answer is yes. It's a great tree. Because it is this tree existing that gives Adam and Eve, or us if we were living in the garden, that gives us the opportunity every day to apply in a practical sense in our everyday life the right relationship with God, the fear of the Lord, produces wisdom, knowledge, and teaches us to hate evil. We cannot become mature spiritual beings, cannot be in God's kingdom, if we cannot tell the difference between Elohim with a capital B, Elohim, I. If we cannot tell the difference between life and death, if we cannot tell the difference between blessing, cursing, we will never, ever, ever be mature spiritual beings, the people God created us to be. In our practical life, day to day, we have to be able to distinguish those things and others. And so God provided a tree so that we could understand evil exists without having to experience it. God knows evil exists, but he's still holy. He wants us to be like him, to know it exists, but to hate it, to avoid it. How do we do that? The fear of the Lord produces fruit, but it, the fear of the Lord has to be tried, the discipline of it, tried, tested. Apply in a practical sense every day. If there's not this ability to avoid by obedience, God said, don't eat it. They obey. Every time they obey, they are in a practical way proving that God is right, that God's word is true when they avoid it. Now, what did Satan say? Satan said, all the good stuff in life is over here. In practical, intimate knowledge of good and evil. You just, it, you, you know it exists, okay, that's that's fine. But you don't know the all the blessings and benefits that come from sin until you have practical, intimate knowledge of good and evil. 
See the difference? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We avoid it because that's obedience. He commanded. When we obey, we grow. When we disobey, we go away. Satan says, you've got to have this. And so they did. Instead of hating it, they allowed it to separate them from the right relationship with God, from the holiness of God, and they accepted sin and death into their life. Now, From the perspective of Satan, you have to have practical intimate knowledge. Now, I was thinking about this today in many different ways. So when it rains, you know, we have mud puddles, right? And it's a lot of fun to go and stomp around in mud puddles. Lots of fun. I don't know. It is. It's not fun for me. <laughs> but before we go and step on mud puddles, splash around in them. Does it not make sense we put on our rubber boots? No. No? <laughs> Bare feet is the best. Bare feet is the best. Okay, but our rubber boots, yeah. we're going to go stomp in mud puddles wearing our wedding dress? No. What would happen if we, we would ruin our wedding? How about our Sunday clothes? Mom might get mad if we go out in our best shoes and our Sunday clothes, start stomping around in mud puddles, because there's a contrast there. If you go out in your dirty clothes and you get your dirty clothes dirty, who cares? If you go out in the best, what did Adam and Eve know? No, they knew the holiness of God. Coming from a fresh, daily encounter with the holiness of God, they saw evil and they jumped in with both feet. That's what we do also. Well, they had the blessing of seeing God face to face. We have the blessing of God's word. We've never experienced the way of, you know, their of the holiness. level of holiness and the intimacy with God. So. That they had. They have, and it's just... But we can, through applying in a practical sense every day, the lessons of the fear of the Lord in our daily life. That's how we grow to it. All right, now from God's sense, our life is not rooted in our body. We need to think about this for a minute. Life is not rooted in our physical body. Our spiritual body was created for, designed for, by God as a place for the spiritual life that he gives us to live. The, bi the biological part of us is temporary. It's going to die. The spiritual part of us is permanent. We have a body formed of earthly materials, the dust of the earth. It could not be essentially immortal. The only way a earthly body can be immortal is when it is transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit to eternal life. Does not the New Testament tell us that? When Jesus comes back, the dead in Christ will rise. Not all of us will sleep, but we will all be changed as our physical body is transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit to eternal life. The power which transforms bodily existence to immortality is spiritual. The breath of life existed before our body. The body just gives us a place, physical place, for the breath of life to live. The power comes from the Word of God. 
God spoke to Adam and Eve face to face. We have the word of God, the spoken word and the written word. We also have the living word, Christ. We also have the Holy Spirit. But the power of the word of God comes through right relationship with God. When God gives us a new heart and he puts a spirit in us, the spirit gives power. The spirit of God works through the word of God. Now, in, in the garden, God, after they said, God said, we're going to have to destroy the tree of life. How much damage can an unrepentant sinner cause in this world? Oh, it's, we can't measure it. How much damage could an unrepentant sinner that never dies cause? That's Satan. We just have one. What if we had millions? Okay, so, the death had to come because an unrepentant sinner cannot be allowed to go through immortality, spreading death and destruction. The tree of knowledge of good and evil was to lead men from, to the knowledge of good and evil from God's perspective, from holiness perspective, so that they would learn to avoid, flee from sin and death. They did it, how did they, would, it, would they have done it? By constantly avoiding every day. When they constantly prove God's word right, the right relationship with God produces fruit, right actions, and practical applications. From God's perspective, the knowledge of good and evil is learned by obedience. Millions things to eat, one to avoid. Obedience is not eating the wrong thing. Learning to discern the difference between God's will and all that opposes God's will through voluntarily avoiding evil, we prove that what God's word says is true. Had they not eaten, mankind could grow to its full development of freedom of choice that God gave originally to Adam and Eve by their obedience. What happens to free choice when we sin? It's gone. It's gone. Once you sin, you're a slave to sin. And slaves have no meaningful free choice. We have that meaningful free choice only through obedience. By obedience to the divine will of God, man would have had knowledge of good and evil from God's perspective, seen it as something to be avoided and hated in accordance with in, in accordance to being created in God's image. Now, in Genesis, Adam and Eve had not yet grown very much spiritually. They, haven't, they hadn't learned yet. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Had they, they would have immediately recognized the evil in Satan's approach. Instead of yielding, they would have resisted. God's word produces fruit when it is applied in a practical sense every day. They did not apply it in a practical sense, and they sin. Same thing happens to us. Same thing happens to churches. I was... 
thinking about a church that I know that used to be a large, vibrant church. Sunday nights, they used to have 100, 110 young people in the youth choir. They had 100, 110 up into Sunday school. Large, vibrant church. No choir. Barely have 100 people in the whole church on a Sunday night. Did applying the fear of the Lord in a practical sense every day produce that? This is a long series of choices where instead of choosing God's way, they chose man's way. Didn't happen overnight. Each one of these places, they could have stopped and said, you know what, guys? I think we ought to try God's word this way this time. But they did. Now, I was thinking of one particular church, but in reality, there's hundreds of churches like this. Yes, unfortunately. Instead of avoiding evil, they embraced. Avoiding means obedience to God's word. Embracing evil, they make decisions from their perspective using human, earthly, natural, demonic wisdom. The true knowledge of good and evil that God set before Adam and Eve could have helped them to to attain and reach true freedom. But because they did not, in a practical way, prove God's word every day, they sinned, which brought only guilt, shame, and death, and broke the right relationship. These are tools that Satan uses to get us to leave the holy fear of God. Doubt. Boy, if I I apply God's word in a practical way to this particular situation in my life, that's going to be hard. And on the other side, did God really say you? I'm skeptical. I'm dismayed. I'm discouraged. All of that is Satan attempting us to leave the holy fear of God and to walk in the unholy fear of God. And that's all I have for tonight. Okay. Okay. So we're trying to learn to see it from God's perspective. And trying to see why, until we apply what the fear of the Lord tells us in a practical sense in our everyday life, we don't have the fear of the Lord yet. We may have some theory about it, but until we've started doing this, we really don't know what it is. Okay? Fun enough. Right, any questions? those online do they have a question no but, uh, did you answer that uh, question that Natasha had okay. yes. yeah. God, the knowledge that God has a knowledge of good and evil but it is not the same knowledge of good and evil that that we are Satan have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
And that's that's how it can be. Okay, good. We can know what death smells like without having or, ever died before. Or the same way when you say that I don't have to try drugs to know that they're evil. Right. So, I mean, some people say, well, until you experience it, you don't know. But, right. I mean, I got enough intelligence to know that I'm not going to try it. Just because I know. I know it's bad, even though I've never tried them and I'm not going to. So. Right. I think that's the that's basically what you're saying. You can have a knowledge without yeah. having to have immersed yourself in experience. Yeah. Yes. And that's how God created us to know the difference between good and evil from his perspective, not from Satan's. Okay? I I don't know if it helps you or not. It helped me greatly. When I was no, but like you know, the question that they, he said that uh, now they like us, like like you know, like knowing good and the evil. good and evil. You know, yeah. uh, why it's, he compares, you know, like uh, the knowledge that they start having it with the. Uh, so well, after they tried the fruit, so now they have this intimate experiential no oh, yeah like he, it so when he says now they're all like us okay but it doesn't mean yeah. that god has no yeah. god does not have that experiential knowledge of evil. He, of course and you know, like but for some reason he will look like us as well. in what way us okay well okay that's the difference between theory and practice like I'm, I'm, we like God today too, knowing the good and evil. Right. In theory, right? Ooh, I'm gonna get personal. In theory, go to that side. Huh? Go to be personal to, to to that group. I know to weigh as much as I weigh is not good. Yeah. Right. Duh. But in practice, <laughs> we like ice cream. Huh? I like ice cream. See, in theory and practice. In theory, I understand certain things. In practice, we do certain things. And through practice, we try it and we prove it. I understand that. I it's the only one thing that it's like a clear, you know. So like, when it's like like us, us you know, like now like they become now. became like us, so knowing good and evil. Like that, God knows okay, evil. So, all right, so practically too, that's what. If Adam and Eve knew knew the same as God about good and evil. Would they have done what they did? No. No. That it's clear to me. But since they didn't know, because they haven't yet, you know, theory and practice. The practice, what we practice is what we believe. Okay. So I can say in theory, I believe tithing is good. It's useless. Until I have Put it into practice in my life. I know nothing about time. Had they known good and evil like God knew good and evil, they would have hated it and avoided it. But they didn't. They were babies. They were just starting out. They haven't proved enough by constantly applying. And they got they became silly and seducible. Okay. Okay. Well, you know. <laughs> he still wants to think about it. So that's no, it's not like you know. It's just. Uh, um, it just. Uh, you know, like it's 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 not like really important, but it's. It is really important. You know, like I don't get it. You know, like in a way, you know, like why is like yeah, if they knew, as God knew, you know, like they wouldn't do it, but now they got it. They 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 got this knowledge. Like personally, uh -huh. and then what? He said, like, now be, they become uh, like us because they know evil 
you know, like, a, like at least now they know the difference, but because they've known holiness, okay. now and I'm, now they're living in sin. They know that. Okay. Okay. And do you think they ever wish they could go back? Uh -huh. I would think so. Of course they did. What does the Bible tell us? He put an angel there. Yeah, he put an angel there so they wouldn't go back. But, but uh, I mean, maybe not go back. They wanted to get the back to right relationship. Well, you think, or maybe they just wanted to get rid of the consequences. They didn't want to die, so they wanted to go back for the fruit of life, so maybe. they could keep living. And how about Genesis 4.26? Adam and Eve, I mean, they, they've already had Cain and Abel. Cain's killed Abel. Verse 26, now a, a new son is born named Seth. Mm -hmm. And to him, to Seth, to him also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. Period. What? Well, then men began to call like upon the name of the Lord. Some time ago, not like some time went past. Yes, yes. Some time. I mean, later, not right away. Maybe I don't know. Right, but at least eventually they um, went back. Eventually, yes. And we're glad. And that happens too. Sometimes people we love go off into sin, and they won't listen to reason. They want to experience it for themselves. And we pray that someday God will bring them back to their senses and they can call upon the name of the Lord. But at least they did come back eventually. Right. Because, here, because here, the the flaming sword was placed there to guard the way yeah, to the said... eat of life. Right, so, because if they eat it, they won't die. See, and what well, did I just that, tell you? Maybe that's what they wanted to go back to maybe because so. they didn't want to die. They didn't want the consequences. But if you have a man controlled by sin who never dies, that can do a lot of damage. Yeah, that's true. So God says, "Hey, nope, 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 nope. You can't come this way." Oh boy. I may get myself in trouble here. Go back to my church that I was telling you about. Did godly men doing sound biblical teaching produce this? Mm -hmm. Yep. If they had listened, the Bible says, if they had listened to my words, they would have. Now, they weren't bad men. They didn't rob banks. As far as I know, they never murdered. A couple of them were accused of taking church money, but it's a little those are <laughs> compared to Keelan. Entrapment, though, right? Huh? It was entrapment, though. Well, for one of them, it was. Mm -hmm. I know that it's the, the I know the circumstances. But he got entrapped because he was saying, "Hey guys, we need to go here." Mm. Mm, that happens too. All right, practical, what we learn every day. All right, thank y'all for your kindness and for listening and we got